This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 138, recorded on October 27th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month, and for our audience, first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code MICROBE. This episode is brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How, oh, yeah. how is small things? Is it well? <laughs> it's going very well. We have a new co-blogger, Roberto Coulter from Harvard, and he's been wow. on board now <laughs> for a while, Great. and we're getting along famously. Wonderful. Excellent. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How have you been? Well? I'm doing well, yep. I'm teaching um, undergraduates about microbiology, having a lot of fun. Uh-huh. How many students do you have? It is a first-year seminar, so it cannot have more than 18 students, which is the number I have. Great. Wonderful. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. No, no more hurricanes for you, Michael? There was one cooking, but it, it blew itself out, so we're grateful. And that's it? Is the season over, basically? No, nah, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Couple, Thanksgiving. All right, three more weeks, more or less. All right. We have wonderful science stories for you today, microbiology. Before I, we get into that, the American Society for Microbiology would like you to know about the Kavli Microbiome Ideas Challenge. This is an invitation to the broad scientific community to submit their ideas for groundbreaking experimental tools and methods for understanding microbial function. The Kavli Foundation has committed $1 million to this uh-huh. Ideas Challenge supporting development of next-generation scientific tools for investigating life on a microbial scale. The challenge is led by the American Society for Microbiology and carried out in partnership with the American Chemical Society and the American Physical Society. So the focus of this challenge is the development of new tools and methods that will help transition the field of microbiome research from correlative studies to causal understanding of microbial function. Gee, that's very forward looking. I like that. <laughs> that's a lot that's a lot of what we complain about here right. on, on too much correlation. So Somebody's hope, been listening. <laughs> that's right. So you can apply for this. Grant submissions opened on October twenty fourth, just three days ago. They're gonna close on December second at eleven fifty nine PM Central Standard Time. Very, very precise. Okay. And they're gonna have three to four awards with a minimum of 250,000 and a maximum of 350,000 per award. We will post a link to this challenge in the show notes. Uh, It's on the cavlychallenge.org site, but there's a long URL and I won't give it to you now, but check the show notes in case you're interested in applying for that and developing innovative uh, new ideas for studying the microbiome. I think it's a good idea. So um, thanks for doing that. Cavalier and ASM and ACS and APS. I think it's interesting. We get the chemists, the microbiologists, and the physicists involved. That's what you need to develop new new approaches, right? It's true. Interdisciplinary. All right. I am going to do a snippet today. This is a very interesting paper. It was emailed to me last week by a listener, Justin. And I said, wow, this has got to be the next on the next twim. It's a paper published in PLOS One. It's entitled Spatial Distribution of Aneuranium Respiring Beta Proteobacterium at the Rifle Colorado Field Research Site. So what this is about is relates to mining. 
And as I think many people know, one of the big problems with mining activity is the outflow of acidic water from metal mines or coal mines, and this pollutes surface and groundwater. Now, this this is called acid rock drainage. It usually occurs naturally in some environments as part of the rock weathering process. But when there are large-scale disturbances like mining, you know, a human activity, you dig a mine out, it gets worse. And the, the water flows through the mine. It's acidic, and it goes outside and contaminates groundwater. Now, this paper deals with outflow from mines, but the mine here is a uranium vanadium mine that was act- active from 1920s to the 1960s. And the problem is how to get rid of the uranium, in other words, uranium bioremediation. And the site is called the Integrated Field Scale Subsurface Research Challenge. It's in Rifle, Colorado. That's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> And speaking of mouthfuls, the EPA has set a standard for the level of uranium uh, in water, in drinking water. It's 0.126 micromolar uranium. You can't have more than that. You can have below it and you can drink it, but above it, you cannot drink it. And this site has lots of uranium in the water. And a number of years ago, they found that if they injected acetate below the surface into subsurface waters... Uh, what acetate does, it's a, it acts as an electron donor, and it stimulates microbial uranium reduction. And when uranium is reduced, it becomes insoluble. It comes out of the water, so that lowers the soluble levels. Tell us, tell us the authors, by the way. Oh, my apologies. I'm so sorry. I'm so excited about this. I forgot. <laughs> the first author is Nicole Coribanix. Coribanix. And then we have Tuarto, Lopez, Chaffarelli, McGinnis, Hogblom, Williams, Long, and the last author is Lee Kirchhoff. They are from Rutgers University, which we were just talking about in the pre-show, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California. Okay, so back to the, the science here. They inject acetate subsurface. This helps reduce the uranium concentration. Now, they've also found over the years that when they add acetate, it shifts the microbial community structure. They don't know if there's a particular microbe in this site that's capable of growth on uranium. So that's what they... Wait, they use an interesting term. Mm-hmm. Adding the acetate is called an amendment. An amendment? <laughs> amendment. That's a technical term for amending hmm. the, the environment. Yeah, amendments of electron donors. Yeah, field amendments. That's when you do it outside, right? as opposed to the lab. Cool. All right. So they want to know who is doing this uh, uranium reduction when they add acetate. So the study site, as I said, is in Rifle, Colorado, right near an old uranium mine. Of course, water is coming out of this mine, got uranium in it. It's contaminating the area. So they have a a neighboring study area, uh, a, a kind of rectangular area. They have a lovely figure in this journal. It's open access, so you can go check it out. And there's a flow of water from one side of this study area to the other. So they have a few areas where they inject the acetate. These are called injection wells. And then they have downstream sampling wells. And, and these are, you know, a certain number of meters below the surface. So these, these monitoring and injection holes were established in 2007. So what they do for this study, they take sections of the, of the earth three to six meters below the surface and They pack these very carefully in anaerobic conditions. They bring them back to the lab. And then they ask, can we grow something out of this which can reduce uranium? And what they do is they grow, you know, they they make extracts of uh, of these soil samples and they grow them on minimal medium with uranium. And by growing on that medium and by colony purification and so forth, they, they obtain an isolate which shows increased growth when you add increasing concentrations of uranium in the presence of acetate. So in other words, they do a titration of uranium in the presence of acetate. You add more uranium, you get more uh, growth of the bacterium. And as this is happening, this uranium acetate dependent growth, you get a change in the solubility of uranium. You start with 90% soluble uranium. They use uranyl acetate, by the way. Uh, And uh, they go to 97% insoluble. 
So it's totally consistent with reduction of uranium from 90% soluble to 97% insoluble. So again, what's happening is the uranium is apparently being reduced uh, by the bacteria using uh, acetate as an electron donor. So the uranium is in its oxidation plus six, and it's being reduced to an oxidation state of plus four. Right. So it's taking a pair of electrons and using it as an accessory electron acceptor, which is why the mi- what's in it for the microbe is the question you always need to ask. And what's in it for the microbe is a place to dump its waste electrons without having to lose that precious carbon because the carbon is is always limited in these dilute streams like groundwater. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well said. Very good. I figured Michael would say something like that because <laughs> he understands this. Um, so what's doing this? This is really a, um, we, we don't know what's in so, the car. So far, so far, this is kind of well known, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we that now is what's new. Yeah, so we know before that bacteria can do this, but they want to know which one is it at this particular site. Uh, so, the so then they take uh, they take this strain that's doing this, and they do. Uh, by the by the way, they call this the rifle strain rifle because rifle stands for that rifle Colorado, and they do 16s ribosomal RNA sequencing, which shows basically it's closely related to Burkholderia fungorum, Burkholderia fungorum which um, I uh, never heard of, never heard of that, but you heard of Burkholderia, of course, of other kinds, right? It used to be Pseudomonas fungorum, but then it got reclassified Mm -hmm. once we got more clever with 16S. That's right. It's Burkholderia fungorum. Okay. So this is the isolate that they have in the laboratory that can reduce uranium. So then they go back out into their field samples and they say, is this, this species actually present out in the field site? And uh, they find it. They find that it ranges in abundance from 0 to 15% in sediments from these different collection wells. And they're mainly in the upper part of the soil column, which is about 3 and 4 meters of depth. So not only is this Burkhold area fungorum working in the lab to reduce uranium, but it's out there in the field site uh, as well, which is good. Because if it weren't there, that would be a big problem, right? The important question, of course, is what genes are involved in uranium reduction. Now, they point out that this particular strain that they have doesn't grow on on iron. And this is different from other bacteria that can grow on uranium. There are a few others that are able to grow and reduce uranium. And usually they can grow on iron as well, but this one doesn't grow on iron, so it's a little different. So they say... This has a practical importance, right? I mean, this this is a good thing. Yeah. If I get rid of uranium, you don't want it to bleed on... Using uh, iron instead. That's right. That's right. It's really great. Um, so they plan to do the genome sequence of uh, this Burkholderia fungorum and compare it with other Burkholderia species that don't grow on uranium, and maybe they can identify what's uh, involved. I don't think that's going to be very easy, right? There are probably going to be lots of differences, and you're going to have to. So what kind of genes, Michael, would you be looking at here for this ability? I, I would just look at the redox enzymes that are involved in. Um, uh, electron transport, mm-hmm. specifically looking at the ones that would dump electrons into, you know, you think of immediately go to cytochromes and and iron sulfur centered uh, proteins that would take the electrons. And so it probably has novel redox balancing uh, membrane protein. So it's going to be my guess is it's going to be a membrane protein and they're likely going to pull the tricks from some of the friends that they mentioned in their discussion, uh, the Geobacker, the Shiwanella, mm-hmm, uh, the mm-hmm. Sulfomaculum, all of these ones that are effectively playing with redox games because this is a, a redox trick that the microbe is using to its selective advantage. So I think that's how they'll probably approach going on the genetic scavenger hunt, if you will. So say so you identify you know, redox genes with changes, how would you prove that they are responsible for uh, um, reducing uranium? Would you introduce the changes into a related strain that doesn't have that ability then and see if it... Now yeah, you could probably, uh, you know, tuck it out and put it into your favorite organism like E. coli or mm-hmm. some of the others and ask, can you confer 
the trait. The the real issue is is how complex the operon is. Right. It's all about uh, passing the hot potato, because remember, when an electron comes out of metabolism, you're you're effectively burning acetate, and everybody knows what hap- The electrons are extremely energetic, and you have to your job in metabolism is to regenerate that initial electron acceptor. And we all in glycolysis know it as oxidized NAD. And so what you need to do is to take the hot potato from metabolism and slowly lower it down the metabolic chain and then dump it into something that is external to the cell. Because as with everything, you always want to throw your trash outside of your house. Mm -hmm. And so you want the waste electron external to the cell itself, and it's ideal if it's insoluble, like the iron four is, mm-hmm. or excuse me, the uranium four. Yep. And and so you want it outside and immobile where the uranium four is then attached to a sediment and it's locked up in that sediment for millennia. Right. And it's only when you uh, in decrease the pH that and you can add acid back that you can then oxidize the uranium four back to uranium six and immobilize it. But if it's really tied up tightly in that sediment, you're so much the better. And that's the hazard with this acid mine issues is because microbes typically uh, will take the metals and they will burn the rock, they literally burn iron two and and these other iron sulfur compounds mm. or like uh, iron sulfides and anything with sulfide because they're stealing the energy from the, the sulfur and the net consequence is they end up reducing the sulfide to sulfate and the byproduct is sulfuric acid, which is why right, when you go out right. to Colorado, you have all these beautiful pristine streams. Right. Now, they make the point that if this – so this happens to be the first microorganism from rifle shown to grow on uranium. In fact, the first member of Burkhold area that can do this. And they say if this bacterium has been around for 60 years reducing uranium, there's probably a lot of insoluble uranium at the site. And they say this could be a problem because normally it's – the soluble uranium is flushed away, right, by groundwater. Now it's stuck there. So it's funny that – you remove it from the water to make the water drinkable, but then it's stuck in the site. And I guess you have to do something about that as well. You have to get rid of it yeah. because the plants will attach it to the roots and, and, and take it up. And you said you could do that with acid, right? Yeah, you can do it with acid. You can acid wash the soil to remove the uranium and it's and it's effectively part of the uranium refining process where you do a series of steps with mm. um, chelating agents and acids and you effectively can refine uranium in that particular uh, – it's called the Urex method. Mm. Interesting. So there you have it. Uh, they end up by saying um, – in addition to all of this that we've concluded, our findings highlight how integrated research at Department of Energy field sites can lead to the discovery of novel metabolic capabilities in different microorganisms and new ideas for promoting biostimulation and uranium reduction at these contaminated sites. So as that's really an interesting outcome that we have a problem, but we can study and learn things that, that can help us. So pretty neat. And I'll, I'll add that our TWIM 132 mm-hmm. was somewhat related. That's where we were talking about Geobacter and its ability to transfer electrons and donate them onto iron oxides or uranium. And they, um, mm-hmm. Hemmer right. Regueras group and others are, are thinking about exploiting this activity to make nano wires uh, that conduct That's electricity. Right. That's right. Yeah. So TWIM 132. 132. Okay. All right. Anyway, nice story. Thank you, Justin, for bringing it to our attention. Uh, I couldn't help but think about, uh, what was it? Hmm. It's totally gone. <laughs> it's off into the air and may never come back again. We'll see. If it will we'll come see. back at four in the morning. Maybe. <laughs> All right. I want to tell you about uh, a sponsor of this show, Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service, over 1,500 titles. Founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel, what you're going to get here is real science. Not It's all nonfiction. 
no fiction or no reality TV or anything like that. The way you view this, you can go on a web browser or in any of those devices that interface the Internet and your TV, like Apple TV and a Roku device. And they have science, technology, nature, history, documentaries, interviews, lectures, a ton of cool science stuff. For example, Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places. This is a pretty neat series. This is a brand new documentary where Stephen Hawking pilots a fantastical spaceship, a computer-generated spaceship across the universe, and he makes stops at his favorite destinations. How cool would that be? We could do the same with our microbes. We could take you on a trip through the, the body and say, yeah, there's one of our favorite microbes there in the GI tract. There it, was a movie called <laughs> Fantastic Voyage. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, Digits, a three-part series hosted by Derek Mueller, who created Veritasium, a YouTube science channel. Deep Time History, the story of the universe's 14 billion year history and underwater wonders of the national parks. What's underneath the bodies of water in the national parks? They also have, in addition to all of this and much, much more, uh, one of the largest nonfiction, super high-definition libraries on the Internet. That's 4K, over 50 hours of content. And they have monthly and annual plans available. And they start at just two ninety nine a month, less than a cup of coffee. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIM. All right, Michael, do you have a paper for us? I do. <laughs> and it's from one of ASM's flagship journals, uh, Applied in Environmental Microbiology. It was published in August, and the title of the paper is Copper Resistance of the Emerging Pathogen Acinetobacter bomani. And it's by Caitlin Williams, Heather New, Jeremy Gilbreth, Sarah Michael, Daniel Zorowski, and Scott Merrow. And the authors are in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland, as well as the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the School of Pharmacy of the University of Maryland, and then the Wound Infections Department of the Bacterial Diseases Branch at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Silver Spring, Maryland. So in preface, the student, the first author, Caitlin Williams, I met in April as she was bundling this up, getting it ready to submit to AEM. And so I had an interesting conversation with her and I was so delighted when this paper uh, came out in in August. It's it's really a, a treasure, and there's a lot of work in this paper. So it's going to take me a little while to get through it, but I think at the end you'll really appreciate it. So Acinetobacter bomani is affectionately referred to by the U.S. military as a bomb, uh, principally <laughs> because of the severity of infections it causes in wounded soldiers. It's really the atomic bomb equivalent of an infection. And they typically acquire these. They're associated with uh, healthcare or there are nosos nosocomial an infection. And this microbe is emerging as a, as a global pathogen and the United States has not been spared. The military, of course, has encountered it because of all the casualties we saw in the Gulf and in Afghanistan. And this microbe is a ubiquitous in the environment. And it has this remarkable ability to survive harsh, dry environments, which it can, which is how it can make it in our hospitals. But most disturbingly, it's highly resistant to antibiotics, where even some of the isolates that they're pulling out of our, our brave soldiers are pan resistant, which means they're resistant to all the drugs in the formulary. If that weren't bad enough, this microbe is capable of causing many types of infections. It's just not that this microbe causes pneumonia, which it does. It's not that this microbe can cause a urinary tract infection, which it can. It also causes bacteremias, skin and soft tissue injuries, 
as well as osteomyelitis, and it can even morph into meningitis. So this is really a pathogen that has many unique abilities to really get around our immune system. And it is especially um, troublesome if you are immune compromised. And, and, and isn't it, in fact, it doesn't very often cause infections in an otherwise healthy person. That right? is absolutely correct. If Michelle. you've got a, you're a soldier and you have a wound, then you're vulnerable, but, or if you're elderly. Exactly. And the authors point out in their great introduction in a recent meta-analysis of studies carried out worldwide, they report the Abamani consistently causes 5 to 10% of hospital-acquired infections and even a greater proportion of HAIs in our ICUs. Hmm. And it's really dependent upon patient demographics and the type of injury or illness that they have as to what's actually going on. And in fact, they point out in a retrospective study out of ICU acquired infections in the ICU of the National Cancer Institute of Mexico, they reported that ABOM was the causative agent of 6% of the total hospital acquired infection, Hmm. but disproportionately represented 60% of pneumonia and 25% of the bloodstream infections. And that's really pretty troublesome, which is why the Uniform Health Services University is is looking into it because there, of course, their their mandate is to train physicians for physicians for our military, as well as uh, they're investigating problems, especially interesting to healthcare in the military. Now, this microbe is a gram negative aerobe. So Whenever I hear gram negative, it means it's easily able to acquire new information. And this paper investigated the potential utility of copper-based antibacterial strategies against acinetobacter infections. And so they're worried about, and this is something that I work on, use deploying copper in the built environment to effectively control HAIs. And so they're concerned as to whether or not a bomb can actually adapt to copper surfaces and, you know, cause more harm than good. So uh, the story that I'm going to tell you is three parts. Part one is they asked a simple question, is a bomani, are a bomani isolates Uh, resistant to the antimicrobial properties of copper. In part two, they asked if this was a genetic trait and whether or not there's a difference between the biofilm-based acinetobacter growth and whether or not the resistance is different in the planktonic uh, growing versions of acinetobacter. And the third part is they asked about the mechanism. So there's three parts to this paper and each one goes into exquisite detail and it's done very carefully and the experiments are very elegant in how they ask the question. So in part one, are ABOM isolates resistant to copper? So they used clinical isolates that were fresh from patient isolation and they asked the question, are these isolates resistant to copper in two ways? The first was the traditional way, growing them up in liquid medium. And then the second way is on solid surfaces. So in their first experiment, they took uh, six different A-bomb isolates and they grew them in concentrations from no copper all the way up to 1.5 millimolar copper. And they measured growth two ways. They measured it by looking at the increase in optical density, and they similarly measured viability. So, and they had these different concentrations. So they tested six strains and an E. coli control, and they did this in triplicates. So they did each growth curve uh, three times. So when you do the variations and the combinations, you see that they did 42 separate growth curves three times, or they have 126 growth curves in the first figure. This is a lot of work, folks. 
I mean, they were doing viable counts, which means diluting and plating and and it's a great lesson in how to do statistics because they did the statistics beautifully. And in broad strokes, they learned that the level of resistance to copper varied broadly across the isolates. Four strains were only minimally inhibited by copper at, at concentrations of one millimolar, and while 1.5 millimolar copper significantly de- delayed growth in liquid medium. However, death was not observed in those four isolates. Then they had two of the isolates that were drastically more sensitive to copper than the others, and they were able to grow normally in uh, concentrations of 100 micromolar, but growth then became delayed when the concentration was increased to 250 micromolar, and once the concentration tripped above 500, they were killed. And E. coli K12 as their positive control as a measure of sensitivity to copper illustrated that K12 isolates were indeed sensitive to concentrations greater than 250 micromolar. And I should point out that did all of these experiments in minimal medium or M9. Now, the reason that's significant is anyone who's ever done a protein assay knows that copper has a high predilection for binding proteins. So if you're growing bacteria in a rich, protein-rich medium like lysogeny broth or luria broth or brain heart infusion broth, they're chock-a-block full of protein. So any copper that you add is going to be immediately sequestered by these proteins because the copper is going to interact. And that, of course, is the basis of why fallen reagent works. So, by the way, there's the converse is also a problem. When you deal with minimum medium, any bit of copper counts for the reason you just said. And I, in my early days, had a real problem growing E. coli and salmonella in minimum medium because the distilled water went to copper, copper pipes. Mm. That's right. And believe me, you could not grow E. coli wow. if you use water like that. You have to use the yeah. ionized and very special water. So copper it really matters in minimum medium. Figure one is a whole lot of work, and I really encourage you to look at it because it really shows, and it also gives you some insight into the experiments that will follow. And Michael, can I ask it, you, so the, some so of these strains have some clear resistance to copper. Is that because there's copper in the environment and that selects for resistance or it's already there automatically? Uh, yes to both questions. Yeah, okay, both. Got it. All right. Yes to both questions. And, and in fact, I think that's why they use so many different isolates that they recovered from patients because you don't know, again, acinetobacter is an environmental organism yeah. and depending upon where the patient picked up the strain. And one of the strains that they're going to use for future work, uh, ABOM 5075, is both highly resistant to copper in liquid cultures, and it's extremely virulent in animal models of lung and wound infection. And so they were really trying to get at whether or not um, the patient would likely uh, encounter something like this in the hospital since Mm -hmm. their principal concern is nosocomial infections. Mm -hmm. So they then did it on a dry surface and they tried pure copper, which is, you know, elemental copper. It's highly refined. And so it's a hundred percent copper metal. They also tried cartridge brass and cartridge brass. The thing that we encase our bullets in is 30% zinc and 70% copper. So if copper is the active ingredient in inhibiting the growth of the microbe, you would expect that it would be concentration dependent. And they also use stainless steel, which has very minimal concentrations of copper in it. And we know from a large volume of literature that's out there is bacteria sit happily on stainless steel. And the only way they die is principally through dehydration. Mm. So in the experiment on solid surfaces, they used mid-log strains, were inoculated, and survival was 
evaluated. Stainless steel is the negative control, and you, what you see is that there's no killing on stainless steel. But when you incubate on pure culture, this resulted in a six log kill. So you're effectively killing a million bacteria and it reached the limit of their detection, which was three bacteria within 30 minutes. So solid. Uh, That's what was so impressive to me is how quickly this killed off logs and logs yeah, of bacteria. Yeah. And we see this all the time in the clinic that it, it just, you know, keeps the clinic completely clean. And so on brass, the kinetics of death was slower simply because there's 30% less copper present. But the limit of detection here was again reached in 60 minutes instead of 30 minutes, which is why the US EPA has a defined public health standard that says that if you're going to claim antimicrobial properties for copper, it's got to achieve a 99.9% .9 kill within two hours. And mm -hmm. so this was well exceeding um, the EPA standard. So then the authors next invest investigated whether the phase of growth was significant. So why is this important? Well, typically you don't have log growing bacteria in the built environment. Most of the bacteria are sitting on surfaces, they are, they're dried down, and they're just waiting for a food source. And so they asked the question here, was the phase of growth significant? And they did it three ways. They, they had log phase cells, which you take an overnight, you inoculate, let it grow for two and a half hours. You have mid log phase cells. They then used early stationary phase, which you allow that same culture to go to six hours. And then they use maximum stationary phase, which is typically what you're going to encounter in the built environment because the nutrients are gone. They don't have much water. So it's effectively mimicking what they're going to see in the hospital. And what they learned is copper resistance was positively correlated with the age of the culture, both on brass and copper coupons and was most sensitive in the log phase. Well, that makes sense because copper is inhibiting metabolism and where is metabolism highest? Metabolism is highest during log phase. Most of the metabolism- It also have something to do with the absorption of copper. The, that's in also- In the phase, bacteria really sort of shut themselves off. You know, they, they become impervious, impervious to an awful lot of stuff. And they're not manning the pumps. They're not effectively right. bringing in this essential exactly. micro trace element. So Elio's jumping ahead. To I'm sorry. <laughs> the, no, that's okay. You're you're effectively doing what every reader needs to do is ask the question, what's actually going on here? And so this is giving them the indication of how they are going to evolve the story that they're telling us. So next up, since the panel of A-bomb isolates showed various levels of copper resistance in liquid culture, they then assessed the full panel of the six a bomb isolates, and they chose the early stationary phase culture growth period in cartridge brass so they could see an effect because pure copper kills so quickly. You know, you want to see if you can see a difference between these if you're trying to figure out if there's something genetic going on. So the strain AB5075 died evenly and gradually but its level still reached the limit of detection within 75 minutes on contract brass. And there were differences between the others, but despite the differences, they were all reduced by seven logs within this 75 minute test period. So these data highlight the ability of solid copper surfaces for, for activity to effectively eliminate a bomb from the built environment. So that is actually good is that stuff that I've all been doing with my solid surfaces tells me mm -hmm. that even though a bomb can survive in liquid, it's not doing too well on, on yep. solids. Yep. So now here's the question you all need to be asking yourself. How is it that they saw a very limited killing of these strains in liquid culture, but saw a dramatic killing on solid surfaces? So they hypothesized that the concentration of copper experienced 
by the bacterium and the droplets of medium of the metal coupons must be much higher mm. than the maximum concentration of achievable in the M9 medium, which was 1.5 millimolar. Any higher concentrations of copper sulfate, it began to precipitate out in M9. So make, this makes is, sense because the coupons are almost pure copper, right? Right. They are. It's very logical. Yeah. And so this is where I got really excited. They used ICPM, ICP mass spec to measure the concentration of copper that accumulated off of these solid surface droplets with the bacteria in there. And they has as their control the concentration of, of copper in M9 medium, and they found the concentration of copper in the stainless steel. And this is where Elio's uh, life experience comes back is uh, the copper was below the threshold, but it was still at 131 uh, micromolar off of the stainless steel. So there's enough copper coming out of their copper pipes. So the concentration of copper that, it, that they observed on these brass coupons and pure copper coupons was, was increased to well over two millimolar within the 75 minute test period. And this was on the cartridge brass. And on the pure copper coupon, the level was greatest. And it, as time increased, so did the concentration of the copper. At 15 minutes, it actually delivered a concentration of two millimolar. And by eight minutes, it was at eight millimolar. So we have never seen a microbe in liquid culture resistant to eight millimolar uh, copper. Someone out there will probably write to us and tell me there is one, but I haven't seen one. So the microbes were exposed to lethal concentrations of copper while incubating on these metal coupons. And Caitlin said that it was this day when they generated this set of data from the mass spec that was really exciting. Because when they saw these incredibly high concentrations, she thought, wow, we, this strategy to reduce the risk of these dangerous infections might really work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We find bacteria occasionally on copper surfaces in the built environment. And the reason for that takes us to the next phase of what they're looking at. And that's namely the biofilms versus the planktonic cells. Now you have to remember that in the hospital, you rarely have bacteria suspended in M9 medium on hospital surfaces. <laughs> they're growing on debris. They're growing on schmutz or other fugitive emissions, you know, proteins from the patient that are being shed, dead skin cells. And so biofilms are, are very different metabolically due to their different growth kinetics, the different gene expression that they have when growing as biofilms. You only have to read quorum sensing literature to appreciate how different bacteria are when they're biofilms. So in this next series of experiments, they looked at as to whether or not copper could kill A-bomb biofilms. So they took preformed biofilms and they used strain AB5711 because it can form substantial biofilms in vitro and is relatively sensitive to copper in the liquid growth assay medium. So you go back to figure one, look at of the strains of acinetobacter. This one was actually inhibited by copper. And so they thought, well, let's look at it as a biofilm and see if it behaves differently than it did when it was growing as a free living cell. So this is their fourth figure, if those of you are following along with the paper. And they were using copper sulfate at 250, 500 micromolar, 1 millimolar, and 1.5. And bacteria growing in the biofilm were reduced to approximately two logs over a 24-hour period. And when the biofilm was treated with the higher concentrations of copper sulfate at one or five, poof. And mm -hmm. as expected, the planktonic cells were more susceptible to the lethal effects and because their numbers were reduced almost uh, a millionfold, 5.5 logs. So the bottom line is copper can still kill mm -hmm. biofilms. It's impressive, though, the difference between the biofilm cells and the planktonic Mm -hmm. That was like, what, a five or six log difference? Yeah. So Caitlin's really put a lot of 
data into this paper. This is a data rich paper. You could have done the planktonic work as a paper. You could have done the biofilm work as a paper, but she elected to put it all into one big paper. And the other thing that their data suggested looking at this is that it appears from the first figures that the A-bombs that are resistant to copper begin to tolerate it because they have this lag phase and then they begin to grow. They're not, they're sort of like inhibited, but then they break through. It's a, it's a prolonged lag. And it reminds me of thinking about when you put E. coli into lactose and there's this lag phase and then boom, it starts to grow once it has induced the operon to deal with the lactose. And so again, they hypothesized whether or not this tolerance adaptation was going on and whether or not you needed genetic expression in order to uh, see resistance uh, to copper. And so they learned that pre-exposure to small amounts allowed the bacteria to initiate growth in the presence of one millimolar copper sooner. And it followed their classic dose response pattern at when they exposed them to as little as two and a half micromolar. It shortened that lag time or reduced the lag to grow and, but this priming plateaued at uh, 10 micromolar. The conclusion then is that this strain that they were testing, ABOM 5075, it was able to mount a tolerance response to copper stress. So, And that's, that's one of the beautiful principles in microbiology, that microbes are designed so that if they start to detect a little bit of a problem, they can quickly mount a defense so that when the problem gets bigger, they're ready. And so this next phase of the paper is the one question that everyone is asking. How is the microbe doing this? So here they introduce us to the putative copper-related genes. And copper resistance to liquid cultures has been known for quite some time. And there's classic ways of, of doing it. And Elio brought up how microbes pump things in and they also can then engineer their pumps to pump it out if the concentration gets too high. And the data generated from this resistant creature, 5075, suggested to them an inducible expression. So they then went on this modern scavenger hunt to identify the putative copper resistant mechanism. And they compared and contrasted what was in the literature with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and E. coli. And there's a whole series of genes out there. And so they made primers and they found 23 putative proteins and compared them to those of E. coli and Pseudomonas. And since Pseudomonas is a soil microbe, Acinetobacter is a soil microbe, it's no big surprise that the genes were more closely related to the Pseudomonas. Now recognize I just summarized probably a year's worth of work mm -hmm. in three sentences. So I apologize. But they then did something really neat is they asked if the expression of the putative copper genes related were triggered by exposure to copper. And they did this via qPCR. And one figure they provide us the operon tech topology. There's four distinct operons where these 23 putative proteins are made. They're located in four regions of the chromosome. And the data show what goes up upon exposure to 2.5 to 500 molar, micromolar copper is shown in their final figure. And what you learn from the figure is what you expect. Yes, you expose to copper and the synthesis goes up. It's an elegant figure that you really need to look at because it, it shows you and they calculate the statistical significance. And I don't know about you, but I was exhausted for them just reading the amount of work that went into this paper. <laughs> I mean, this team, I mean, the ICP mass spec was a paper by itself and it was just elegant. So in summary, copper sensitivities varied among strains of Acinetobacter bomani. And it again, goes back to what Vincent was hypotheses. You know, these grow in the soil, they get exposed to different amounts and, you know, the genes may be a little bit different. They may be, and they got to begin to work on characterizing differences among different A-bomb strains. So some of these, some of these genes don't go up, in fact, so they must not be involved, right? Right. 
and or all constitutively the, active or they're constitutively yeah, active and they're part of the basic membrane topology to get them out in there. And one doesn't ever really know why some genes are in mm. operons and others aren't. All of the strains tested were killed rapidly on copper containing surfaces. So that means my work is still good. <laughs> and this was well within the EPA's requirement for the public health claims, mm -hmm. which is good news for hospitals. Third, biofilms could be killed by copper, albeit requiring a higher concentration than planktonic cells. But that's no big surprise because bio biofilms are inherently resistant. And there's 23 putative proteins that they can begin to compare and contrast that may be involved in copper resistance. And as Vincent just said and Michelle said, we really need to begin to look at this expression slash upregulation and, and how tolerance and adaptation will really uh, play out in the built environment. And so I was, I was most impressed with Caitlin when I met her and the team. At, I met the entire lab, Scott Merrill's lab. I didn't get to meet Scott. Scott was away when I visited Allison O'Brien's department. But it was a, a great visit, and I was delighted to uh, be able to present this paper to you guys here today. So, Michael, you think an approach would be to start knocking out these uh, putative copper resistance genes and see, you know, if you have uh, susceptibility one by one or in, in uh, combinations and so forth. Take or them, maybe build, take out the whole thing, right? <laughs> or build them into E. coli. Right. Yeah, or, or transfer them to another mm -hmm. antibody strain that's less resistant and ask if you can confer resistance by with one operon gain a function yeah, yeah now are these are these all putative pumps michael uh some are and some aren't okay. some are you know and it, it really requires a much more detailed analysis yeah. i didn't look go into detail on all 23 of the genes to see where what they were actually doing but there's a very large table table four that actually describes uh, what the genes are and their uh, activities. One happens to be a sugar phosphatase. And mm -hmm. Michael, does um, is there copper resistance or have people looked for copper resistance in, in other species? Yes. Everybody has been trying to ascertain whether or not there is a strain of bacteria out there that can withstand a mm. solid copper surface. But to date, no one's been able to uh, find one. And I think principally because uh, the concentration that you're getting off of, of uh, the solid surfaces is, is so high. And mm -hmm. Bill Keevil has done a lot of work. Remember, we did one of Keevil's papers on an earlier TWIM. And he was able to illustrate on how copper effectively accelerates free radical generation inside the cell once it gets pumped in. Because as Elio pointed out, there are indeed pumps to bring in copper ion into the cell. And thermodynamics is a very jealous mistress. And she will bring in <laughs> as mm -hmm. much copper. And that then complexes with the hydrogen peroxide that's produced naturally by metabolism. And then you get a Fenton reaction. And the Fenton reaction is 100 times more active than the Fenton reaction uh, catalyzed by iron. And so mm -hmm. it generates more peroxide and more free radicals. And then what Kievel showed is that then results in the fracturing of the nucleic acid. And you know, nucleic acid is both DNA and RNA. So if you're making a message and the copper is being transported in at that eight millimolar concentration, you really have hell to pay in terms of winning the race. You know, metabolism can only go so fast before um, you die. And remember, these bacteria in the built environment aren't present in very high concentrations. So it's unlikely you can hide in the middle and hope that the copper concentration doesn't get to you before you are able to pump it all out. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So, Caitlin, 
is a senior PhD student in the Merrill Lab. Uh, before beginning graduate school, she earned a BS in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Richmond. And while there, she worked in the lab of Laura Renyan Yenicki, who studied an intracellular bacterium that is a symbiont of the tsetse fly. <laughs> so as a kid, Caitlin always loved math and science, and she also loved dolphins and whales. For a long time, she wanted to grow up to be a marine biologist. But as a teenager, she visited the public library and came across the book, The Demon in the Freezer, which is mm. a Richard Preston book on smallpox and anthrax. And after reading the book, she became fascinated by the clever ways microbes can wreak havoc on the human body. So how can something so tiny cause so much damage? And then she had a friend who was working on a PhD in virology who invited her to come into the lab. And when she got home, her mom said, so how was it? What was your first day like in a real lab? And she said, mom, walking through that door with a biohazard symbol on it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and her mom replied, her mom replied, Caitlin, that's what a lot of girls say about shoe stores. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I... Caitlin knew that she was never a typical teenage girl, and she's really glad that her parents embraced her love of science and supported her pursuit of infectious disease in particular. Nice. That's great. They had a number of great collaborators who were co-authors. For example, the um, MS experiments were done by um, biochemists Heather New and Sarah Michael. Caitlin's best advice for future graduate students is to seek out great mentors. She attributes her success this far, thus far to um, the professors that she had and their devotion to her future. So she recommends any students who are thinking about graduate school to find a program where the faculty are really committed to training. She also appreciated that for her bachelor's degree, she was at a school, University of Richmond, that focused on research. So as an undergrad, she worked in a real research lab, published a first author paper. So her advice is if you're thinking you might want to be a scientist, find a college or an opportunity to get some research experience. She herself hopes to become a, a professor one day, so she'll have the opportunity to pay all this forward and invest in future generations of scientists. And I can only echo her sentiment about uh, Uniform Services University, especially under the leadership of Allison O'Brien. Allison has such a wonderful department of colleagues. The way the visit was organized when I went there in April is I got to meet all of the graduate students one-on-one. -on -one. They It was sort of like a faculty interview, except instead of talking to faculty, you talk to the students. And I literally talked to them about their projects and saw the enthusiasm that they were all displaying. And it was just, you could tell that the department really is concerned about mentoring students. And it was a joy. Uh, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much fun I had at that visit. And uh, Caitlin, Caitlin, was just fantastic. I should mention with, with gladness that uh, Scott Merrill, the senior author, got his PhD at my old department and Michelle's old department at Tufts Medical And you School. beat me to it, Elio. I was going to say that I'm <laughs> sure Scott, he, who benefited from the great training environment they had in that department at Tufts, where all the faculty cared about the different students, not just who was in their lab. I'm sure he brought that and added to Allison O'Brien's culture of training. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Yep. This episode is sponsored by Drobo, the makers of storage solutions for your computer. They are multi-drive bay solutions, 5, 8, or 12 drive bays. And they are beyond RAID. If you're familiar with RAID arrays, Drobo is beyond RAID because it's designed to protect your important data forever. No other storage array sets such a high goal for itself. How does it do this? It protects you against a single or two drive failures. If one of the drives fails, you simply pull it out and replace it with a brand new one, and all your data are still there and restored onto the new drive. And it's all done via lights. Each drive has a light next to it. If it's green, everything is fine. If it's yellow, the drive is filling up, and you should swap it out for a brand new one of bigger capacity. If it's red, it's full. If it's flashing red, it's broken, and you need to replace it. But in all cases, you can just pull the drive out as it's running, put a new one in, you won't lose any data. So your data are protected forever. No other RAID configuration can do that. They have different sizes and configurations of Drobos. They have five and eight and 12 drive systems. They even have a Drobo that is network attachable. You can plug it into your Ethernet 
switch or router, and it'll be accessible not only on your local network, but from all around the world. They have very cool ways of doing that. Microbe TV listeners can save $100 off on their purchase of a Drobo 5D, 5DT, 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system. Just go to drobostore.com and use the discount code microbe100. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIM. I also want to tell you about the American Society for Microbiology's grant writing online course. They provide an overview of the NIH and NSF grant processes. Topics included in this webinar include a broad overview of the grant writing enterprise, writing NIH and NSF biosketches, and viewing grants from the reviewer's perspective. It's a six-part series. It'll take place from January through March of 2017. You need to register, and there is a small fee associated with this. Registration deadline is February 10th. Go to bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17 to find out more information. That's bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17. All right, that's TWIM138. You can find it at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Consider supporting us so that we can do more with our shows. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute and learn more. And we love, of course, getting your questions and comments. Send them to TWIM at microbe.tv. Didn't have any for this episode. I guess everybody is working hard, but mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to get them. So send them in. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Consider. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Piacere. <laughs> Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Vincent. And your career remains intact, right? Yes. That and, <laughs> and, and the ever-famous Cubs are now even with the Cleveland Indians. They're, they're in a World Series, is that right? They're in a World Series. So the guess, World Series. I guess you would be a, a Cub fan, Michael, right? I am, in, I am indeed a Cubs oh, fan. Well, good luck. Good luck. We desperately need it. It's been 108 years. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM. Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on Twim is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. Check out his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.